Hello, 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 and welcome, my friends, to this fabulous Friday edition of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. So glad to be here with you all on this very bright evening. If you are in Philadelphia, you see that it is still quite bright outside because remember we sprang forward when we moved our clocks one hour ahead so it stays daylight more outside just a few minutes ago maybe about 10 minutes ago or so my nephews were outside but one of them went home so it's not so much fun being outside by yourself but they were outside and they were having a grand old time Okay. Hello, Miss Kate. So happy to see you here this evening. So my friends, happy, fabulous Friday to you, Miss Kate, and to all of the Miss Hope's Reading Hour family and friends. Hopefully, after school was over today, you got to get outside a little bit and play and have fun and breathe in that wonderful fresh air. Get some of that vitamin D on your skin. Feel the breeze. It's that time of year, right? It's almost Easter break, my friends. So you'll be able to do a lot of that during Easter break. Well, hopefully you had a very thankful Thursday and that your Friday so far has been fabulous. Um, today in my class, we learned about um, pop art today. So we kind of learned about it first. And then maybe next week we will get to do a project about pop art and use making pictures of donuts. Because who doesn't like donuts? right? We'll use pictures of donuts to make our own pop art. So maybe next week when we do it, I will make my picture too. And then I will come back and I will show you my pop art picture of donuts. Okay. And we got to play this really cool guessing game today. Um, it was online, of course, but to see what was drawn and what was real. And it's this amazing artist on YouTube who he has the thing that's real next to a drawing of what that real thing is. And it looks exactly the same. Some of the kids were getting them right. I was getting some of them right. We both got some of them wrong, but it was still a really fun experience. So hopefully all of my friends who are in virtual or hybrid or all day in-person school, you got to do some fun things like that this week. And hopefully you get to do a lot of fun things this weekend since it is Fabulous Friday. So if you saw the teaser, my friends, today we will be talking, reading about some science. Mm -hmm. And remember, happy Women's History Month. It's still Women's History Month. So happy Women's History Month. Women's history is for everybody because you know why? It affects everybody, not just women, okay? Now, before we get to our wonderful books, let's get the disclaimer out of the way. The wonderful music you will hear today and the awesome books we will read, unfortunately, Miss Hope and Miss Hope's Reading Hour do not own the rights to them, but they are here for your listening and reading enjoyment, okay? Now, also, if you would like to donate, to the Miss Hope's Reading Hour Library, look down here at the ticker. You can donate via Cash App or send digital gift cards to our email address. And if you just so happen to just want to send me some books, you can use that same email address to get in touch with me so that you can just straight up send me those books right here to Miss Hope's Reading Hour. All right, now my friends, 
let us get to our books. So our first book today is called The Bug Girl. Mm -hmm. The Bug Girl, a true story. So this is a true story. This book is written by the bug girl herself, Sophia Spencer, with Margaret McNamara, illustrated by Kara Scote, or Scote. Hopefully I did not butcher that. I apologize if I did. But this is the bug girl. All right. And also, our next book is called Ocean Speaks. How Marie Tharp revealed the ocean's biggest secret. The ocean has a secret? We will find out what that is. This book is by Jess Keating and illustrated by Katie Hickey. Ocean Speaks. We got to find out what that secret is in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And of course, we will continue with a girl who ain't no junk. Patina, Patty for short. She ain't no junk. Some things are happening in Patty's life. She's starting to realize some things. May not be all comfortable with it, but we'll see how those things affect her in her new life, living with Momly and her uncle, okay? So now let us get to our first book, The Bug Girl, a true story, written by the bug girl herself, Sophia Spencer. All right, let's see. Look at that. They look the same underneath the dust jacket. The Bug Girl, a true story. Now, me personally, there's some bugs that I like, but most bugs, mm mm mm. Miss Hope is not a fan of the bugs, especially big ones. Mm. Butterflies, yes. Ladybugs, yes. Other ones, not so much. <laughs> Dragonflies freaked me out the first time I saw them because I didn't realize that they were that big. I was like, whoa, that is a big bug. Now let's get to the bug girl. The first time I made friends with a bug, I was two and a half years old. My mom took me to a butterfly conservatory, which is like a zoo for butterflies. As soon as we got there, a butterfly perched on my shoulder. It means it sat on her shoulder. It flitted onto my hand and my foot my elbow and my head, even my nose. It stayed with me the whole time we were there. She's a butterfly magnet. That is pretty cool. I love butterflies. When I face paint, usually before I paint anyone's face, I paint a butterfly on my hand. <laughs> All right, when it was time to go home, a guard stopped us at the door. I'm sorry, miss, the butterfly has to stay here, he told me. Say goodbye to the butterfly, said mom, but it didn't move. Carefully, gently, the guard took the butterfly from my shoulder and after a moment, he flew away. Bye-bye, butterfly. I said, that is cool. That butterfly really liked her. From that day on, I was bug crazy. The other kids liked storybooks. I liked bug books. The other kids watched cat videos. 
I watched bug videos over and over and over. Wow, she really liked those bugs. <laughs> I noticed bugs everywhere I went. By the time I turned five, I knew a lot about bugs. There are billions of bugs on our planet. Bugs have been on Earth way longer than humans have. They live on every continent, even Antarctica. I did not know that. One way or another, most plants and animals rely on bugs to survive. The scientific name for bugs is arthropods, but I'll call them bugs for short. In kindergarten, nobody minded that I loved bugs. Awesome, cool. Prehistoric dragonflies are as big, were as big as seagulls. What? Okay, then I would have probably really been freaked out by that one. <laughs> seagulls, have you seen those? They're huge. When the other kids in my class started a karaoke club, I started a bug hunter club. Every weekend, my friends and I took our bug buckets and nets and magnifying glasses out to the stream near my house. We collected fireflies and watched them glow. We identified beetles by their two sets of hidden wings and counted the spots on ladybugs. We watched dragonflies hover like helicopters. We even collected stink bugs, which really can stink. <laughs> I may have stayed away from the stink bugs though. I took the bugs home to study them. Mostly, I had to keep them out on the porch so they wouldn't escape and crawl around the house. It's just mom and me at home, so we share chores. Mom has lots of rules. Make your bed, clean up your clothes, keep your room neat, no ants in the house, unless they're in an ant farm. I have just, I have just one rule. All bugs must live. If there's a mosquito buzzing, I snatch it up in a napkin and let it go. We don't have a fly swatter. We have fly nets. One night, my mom saw a water bug, a giant flying roach, in the middle of the living room. She knew the bug rule was important to me, so she didn't kill it. She put a net over it and waited for me to find it in the morning. But when I lifted it up, when I lifted up the net, it was gone. Whew. I've seen one of those before. Scared. <laughs> when I got to first grade, everything changed. Nobody wanted to hear about bugs. Nobody thought bug facts were cool. At first, I didn't mind. Bug scientists are called entomologists. Show off. Why are you wearing that? Then I brought a grasshopper to school. I thought the kids would be so amazed by the grasshopper that they'd want to know all about it. But they didn't. A bunch of kids crowded around me and made fun of me. Sophia is being weird again, one of them said. Ew, gross, said another. Get rid of it. Then they knocked the beautiful grasshopper off my shoulder 
and stomped it until it was dead. Oh, that was so mean. Why would you do that? That night, I went home and cried and cried. Those kids are wrong, my mom said. It's okay to love bugs, Sophia. I know, I said. It just doesn't feel like it. Wow, that was super mean. I had to go back to school, but I didn't bring a bug with me ever again. That didn't stop kids from making fun of me. Why, does it, why doesn't she like regular things? I don't want to be friends with a bug lover. She's so strange. Man. That is not nice, y'all. About halfway through first grade, I took a break from bugs. Oh, man. My mom did not like seeing me so unhappy, not one bit. She knew I needed to find other people who loved bugs as much as I did. She wrote an email to a group of entomologists asking for one of them to be my bug pal. She wanted me to hear from an expert that it was not weird or strange to love bugs and insects. Maybe somebody will write back, said my mom. Maybe, I said, or at least call. We thought those scientists would be too busy to respond. But three days later, my mom got an email. She opened it. It's from a bug scientist named Morgan Jackson, she said. He wants me, he wants to put my letter online so that other entomologists can read about you. Okay? Okay, I said. Morgan Jackson posted my mom's letter and he asked other bug scientists all around the world to let me know that if they had to let me know if they had any advice for a girl who loves bugs. Wow, that is pretty awesome. Not just one scientist, a whole bunch of them. Two days after that, messages and posts and videos poured in. I couldn't believe how many people around the world loved bugs as much as I did, and how many of them were grown up women. Some were scientists who wrote about the work they did in their labs. Others shared videos of themselves with bugs on their arms and sent pictures of themselves hunting bugs in the wild. Wow, look at all that mail. <laughs> I looked at those messages day after day. All these people love bugs, I said to my mom. They do, she said. And they're not weird. Nope, said mom. They're curious, just like you. <laughs> Newspaper reporters read my story online and they started calling my mom to find out more. The reporters asked to interview me and I talked to them on the phone. My mom and I appeared on television, which was a bit scary. It's hard to be on television when you're just an ordinary person, but I did. I wanted to get the word out that it's okay to love bugs. <laughs> Then Morgan Jackson decided to write a scientific article about how entomologists can get young people excited about science. Morgan asked if I would like to help write the article. 
I said yes. Of course I would love to help write your article. School got a little easier after that because I didn't feel so alone. And nowadays, I like even more things. Gymnastics, time travel books, swimming, and technology. But not too long ago, when somebody asked me to describe myself in three words, I said, the bug girl. That's because I'm happiest when it's just me. A few green leaves, some drops of water, and a bug to keep me company. <laughs> the end. Wow, what a great story. Just to let you know what else is in the book, look, bug facts. So you can find out more about all different types of bugs. Then you can find out about Sophia's top four bugs and why they are her top four. And then the life cycle of a butterfly and how to study bugs out in the wild. What an awesome story. And guess what? Let me show you a picture of Miss Sophia. Wait, 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 let's see. You see that picture right there? That is Sophia. Sophia is a young one, just like all of you. So this isn't just an adult who's writing about her story. This is a young girl who's writing about her love of bugs. So let this be a lesson to all of you who have something that you're super interested in and you really love and other people may not understand it. Don't let anyone dim your light or love or joy that you have for something that may be different because there are many, many other people out there who love the thing that you love too, okay? Some people may not understand why you love it and that's okay. They can love the things that they love. They can like sports or they can like singing. And if you like bugs, say you like being a ventriloquist, the people who work with puppets that talk and your mouth barely moves when you talk, that can be your thing and it's okay. And guess what? There are millions of other people out there who like the thing that you like too. And you can always find a community of people who love and find joy in the things that you love and find joy in. And if you find someone who likes something that you think might be a little weird, they're not making you like it. So don't be mean to them just because it's not something that you're into. Let them have the thing that they like and that they find joy in you have the things that you like and find joy in. And maybe, just maybe, you can learn to like that thing too, or at least appreciate it, okay? Such a great story. Thank you so much, Sophia, for writing your story. Thank you. And remember, young ones, I told you, you don't have to wait to write a book. You can write a book right now, okay? And maybe get one of those wonderful medals that we've seen on other books. Now, let us get to our second book, Ocean Speaks. How Marie Tharp revealed the ocean's biggest secret. I want to find out what this secret is. I want to find out. And this book also looks the same underneath the dust jacket. You know, Miss Hope loves that. 
This book is by Jess Keating. And this is a Tundra Books book. The beach was a blanket of squishy soft sand and Marie wanted to feel it under her feet. Shoes off, socks off. The ocean stretched out before her like a big blue mystery. The waves were talking to her, whooshing up to her toes and sighing away again. One of my favorite things to do is be on the beach and have my feet in sand. Can't wait to be able to do that again. Marie loved going into the countryside with her father to search for treasures. She discovered forests and farmhouses, boulders and bird cages, wheat fields and waterfalls. Marie's curiosity was as big as the world she wanted to explore. <laughs> Curious, just like Sophia. When she was old enough, Marie wanted to study the earth like her papa. She wanted to be surrounded by rocks and trees, soil and mountains, sunlight and fresh air. But those were jobs for boys, not girls. When Marie was growing up, girls were not supposed to dream of becoming scientists or explorers. And why not? They could. Instead, she had to take art classes. Marie sketched in her notebook. She learned about stylish outfits, shapes and designs. And she stuck her sculptures together with gum. Marie did not take art for long. <laughs> I don't think that's how you're supposed to put sculptures together. <laughs> Soon, many men went many men, sorry, went off to fight in a war. With the men away, women were encouraged to learn science. Marie saw her chance. She began studying geology, math, chemistry, and physics. There was so much to explore. She discovered geodes and geometry, equations and elements, atoms and antimatter. Whoa, she was a smart cookie. <laughs> Marie was so proud when she got her first job in a laboratory in New York. When her male colleagues returned from war, they were sent on research trips. Marie wished she could go too. They were sailing the Atlantic Ocean using high frequency sounds to explore the ocean floor. They got to work with the sun on their skin and the salt in their hair. But women were considered bad luck on ships. Marie wasn't allowed to join her colleagues. <sighs> she had to stay behind. I wonder where that came from. Women being bad luck on ships. Box after box full of depth measurements were sent back to the office. Marie's job was to use the data to create a map of the ocean floor, plotting every point on paper. She knew the ocean and its secrets were inside these boxes. So she set to work. Marie's fingertips became stained with ink. Eraser shavings fell to the floor. Her drafting lamp hummed beside her. She had found another way to follow her dream. With her map, she could be an explorer after all. That's a lot of drafting paper. 
Instead of the vast open ocean, she dove into her tiny cramped office. Instead of crashing waves, she sailed through reams of smooth paper. Instead of clouds, she made calculations. Instead of the dark, mysterious ocean depths, she swam through bottles of pitch black ink. Marie mapped point after point after point. Inside her small office, Maria's map grew bigger and bigger. I wonder what it looked like after she, oh, oh, and bigger. Soon Marie wasn't in her office anymore. She was an explorer on the ocean floor, surrounded by valleys and peaks, mountains and canyons, dips and hills. Look at that. That is pretty awesome. I was not expecting that. After weeks of work, Marie looked at her map. Something was wrong. There was a deep rift valley on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean, a long crack with mountainous peaks on both sides. The ocean was talking to Marie again, but what was it telling her? She's gotta figure out what it's saying. Marie showed the map to her colleague. He yelled, he argued, it must be a mistake. Nothing but foolish, silly girl talk. He told Marie to redo her work. She knew her map was correct and was eager to prove it. Sir. No need to yell. Marie dove into her paper ocean once more. Again and again, the great rift appeared. Like a seam on a baseball, the rift circled the, o the earth on the ocean floor. Earth's crust appeared to have moved and shifted apart somehow. Wow, that is amazing to discover. Despite her evidence, nobody believed in Marie's work. One man, an explorer named Jacques Cousteau, decided to prove her wrong. He sent his cameras down, down, down. He expected to film an empty ocean floor with no rift valley in sight. <laughs> he was wrong. Marie's map had revealed the ocean's biggest secret. The Rift Valley was, a, was as real as any valley on land. There were mountains beneath the waves, hidden by the ocean's great depths. Marie had discovered what would soon become the largest known mountain range on our earth. Her map became famous because of it. Scientists started wondering, how did the ocean floor move like this? Was it still moving? What other truths could we learn by studying the hidden depths? Marie's map opened the door for us to better understand our planet. Good job, Marie. Next time, Marie visited the ocean, 
She listened to it whoosh and sigh around her. She felt the sun on her skin and the salt in her hair. And she smiled. <laughs> the end. Wow, what an amazing. Oh, let me show you a picture of Marie Tharp. There she is, right there. You see? That was amazing. The biggest mountain range on the earth is underneath the water. And they would have never known it if not for Miss Marie Tharp. What an amazing story. That was pretty cool. I'm so glad I got to read these two books for you today. So both Sophia and Marie, they had to deal with people thinking, no, you shouldn't do that or you can't do that. This is for boys and not girls. Kids don't think stuff like bugs is interesting or amazing, but they just kept going. Sophia had a little bit of time when she was like, well, no, maybe I'll stop learning about bugs. Hello, Miss Brandy. How are you? I'm so glad that you could be here with the boys. So let this be a lesson to you, my young ones and my older ones, okay? There is no job that you can't do, no career, nothing that you can't study. Guess what? If you're a boy and you want to be a nurse, guess what? You can be a nurse. If you are a woman and you want to be in the military, you can be in the military. That is okay. You are able to do that. And both of these ladies let us know that just because people tell you you can't doesn't mean that they're right. You absolutely can. And Marie taught us that you stick to your guns. You let people know, no, I think I'm right about that. And I do have something that I can contribute, whether I'm a girl, whether I'm a boy, whether I'm a young one, or whether I'm an adult, I can contribute something too. And whether you like it or not, people will notice and they will take into account all of the greatness that's inside of me. Because guess what, my young ones? You have greatness in you. All of my boys and girls, you have greatness in you. And no matter how many times people try to snuff out your light, how many times people try to hide your greatness underneath the bushel, nothing can stop your greatness from shining. And these two people, Sophia and Marie, they proved just that. Sophia, she thought she was the only one who liked bugs, but then she found out that there's a whole lot of people who like bugs and they saw the greatness in Sophia and they wanted everyone to know about it. Marie, they wanted her to just do art or things that supposedly girls are supposed to do. But then her greatness shone, even though she wasn't able to go on the expeditions, even though she wasn't able to go on the ships, she was able to travel the ocean with all the plots and calculations. And no matter how much they tried to dim her light, it just kept shining. So let that be a lesson to you, young ones. Whatever greatness is inside of you, no one can put that light out. And eventually, everyone will see your greatness because it's there. Even if you can't see it yet, it's there. Okay. Oh, I'm so glad I read those books. Learn something new today along with you. I did not know the largest mountain range is underneath the water. So glad I got to learn that with all of you. Now, my friends, let us get back to our girl, Patina. 
Patina, Patty Ain't No Junk by Mr. Jason Reynolds. So we got to chapter six on our wonderful Wednesday. And we learned from chapter five that Patina is finally kind of starting to make friends with the other people on um, the Defenders team. And she's starting to kind of speak up and say, you know, even though you think it's weird to do ballroom dancing, to learn how to do the relay, she's becoming more open to things. When at first she was just like, I have to be the protector of Maddie, my sister. I have to make sure that my mom is okay, even though I can't live with her anymore because of her amputation. But now she's starting to learn. Maybe I can let people take care of me. Maybe I don't have to act like I'm so much of the adult and the protector. Because when Mom Lee comes to pick her up from track practice, Maddie's homework is already done. Already done. You know, Maddie has all of her cares taken care of, care of already. She's already taken care of. That's my job. Maybe not. Maybe you can let people take care of you. Maybe you can make some friends. Maybe you can let your guard down. Let's find out what else she learns as we get deeper into her story. So she already thinks that she's going to have to do most of the work for this Frida Kahlo presentation at her new school, Chester Academy. But you never know. Maybe TNT and Becca will come through and have something to contribute. Let's see in chapter six. Chapter six of Patina. Patty Ain't No Jump by Jason Reynolds. Hmm. Me and Uncle Tony have been close forever. He's one of these big kid grown-ups, a goof troop, all jokes all the time. And when I was younger, he was one of the only people who could make my mom laugh, like laugh, like a laugh that seems to come up from her feet after we lost my father and up from her belly after she lost her feet. As a matter of fact, he was one of the only people who could make any of us laugh back then. I'm almost done, I said, bookmarking the websites I've been browsing. Tell Mom Lee I'll be right out to help. I jotted one last note. Something I'd read that I didn't think was that important to the project, but maybe. Number four, Frida was close to her father. And that, more than anything, was what me and Frida had in common. Only difference is, Frida's dad didn't die when she was young. So she didn't know what that was like. She didn't know what it felt like to be broken until she was older. And not only did I know the feeling of something breaking inside of me, I also had to watch my mom go through it and basically get paralyzed in a whole different way, in her brain and in her heart. Matter of fact, after dad passed, that's when Ma got all churchy churchy. The beginning of catching the spirit and dancing in the aisle and praying for peace in the eye of the storm. But she had no idea the storm was just getting started because that's also when she started eating. Like a lot. And not just regular food, but sweets. All my dad's favorite recipes, sweet potato cheesecake and peanut butter brownies and white chocolate cookies. And of course, the delicious yellow cupcake with the strawberry icing. Your daddy used to say this thing was so good, they'd make you slap your mama, mama would say, nibbling the top of the cupcake. So you better not have too many of them. We'd do like a ha ha ha, and then she'd have too, too many of them. 
I guess maybe the sweets were a way of staying kind of connected to dad. Dessert for the des dessert for the deserted. And I'm not going to pretend like it wasn't amazing living in a house that always smelled like cooked sugar, which smelled like him and heaven. It was great, but eventually it wasn't because diabetes came and took Ma's legs, took most of what was left of her laugh too. And that's when the actual storm reached maximum storminess. And I was pretty messed up by the whole thing, but doing my best to be strong and brave and big and all the other things I didn't really feel like being at the time. I'd rather be sneaking lipstick on in the bathroom, sending cotton selfies of how fly I looked, then washing it all off so my mother wouldn't see it, or sitting on the curb at Cotton's, painting our nails with the nail polish I wasn't allowed to wear that her big brother skunk would steal from the beauty store, even though I would have to scrub mine clean before I came back home, unless it was clear polish. But then, what's the point? Or trying to convince my mother to let me use cucumber mango or berry rose water or kiwi coconut or any other fruity, flowery, good smelling lotion on her swollen, cracked up legs. Flipping through magazines, cringing at kitten heels, even though those were the only ones I ever had a shot of wearing in Bev Jones's house. That's what I used to do, what I wanted to be doing, but I couldn't do none of those things no more. At least not like I wanted to, because now I had to look out for Maddie, who was just confused. I think she just turned four. She had just turned four. Too young to really understand what was going on with Ma's health. And it was really hard to explain it all to her. So I told Maddie that Ma's legs had to go away. Looking back on it, maybe it wasn't the best idea. But at the time, it was all I had. And it seemed to help. And that's when that crazy thing I was talking about earlier, that crazy moment with Maddie, happened. She asked me to help her write a letter. She said it was for school. So, of course, I grabbed a pencil and a sheet of paper from her backpack, set Maddie in the little chair at her desk, leaned over, and asked what she wanted the letter to say. She wanted it to say... Dear Mommy's Legs, I remember my hand instantly started shaking and I had to squeeze the pencil tight enough. I had, I'm sorry, I was squeezing the, temp, the pencil tight enough to snap it in half, but I kept writing what Maddie told me to write. Where did you go and why did you have to leave? And what are you doing? Are you having fun without us? Are you jumping? Are you dancing? Are you running fast? Please come back. We miss you. Love, Madison Jones. I dropped the pencil. Maddie, what? What you what you gonna do with this? I tried to clear the shake from my voice. And it took me flexing every muscle in my body, even cracked my toes just to keep the tears inside my face. Thank goodness her back was to me. First, I'm going to bring it to school for show and tell. Oh, okay. Um, And then what? Well, after I show it to the class, I'm going to see if maybe you could send it. Send it? To the legs. Maddie threw her head back her big eyes staring at me. Hold it in, Patty, hold it in. Um, yeah, yes, I will um, send it. I kissed her forehead. Your legs ain't gonna run away too, are they? She asked, 
worry suddenly washing over her face. No, Maddie. I slapped my legs. These ain't going nowhere. How do you know, she asked. I didn't have a good answer to that. And instead, toothed my bottom lip to keep it from quivering. I just, I just do. I eked out barely. I'll prove it. How, she asked. How you gonna prove it? Well, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. Don't say it, Patty. Don't say it. I promise. I said it and instantly felt like I messed up. Like I said something wrong. I wished I had had an invisible cupcake to stuff in my mouth. Something, some stupid pretend tea, anything. I mean, how was I going to prove my legs weren't going to run away from me? Would this be one of those things I was gonna have to hope Maddie just forgot about? But the pressure of it all was worth it because the worry on Maddie's face unwound. She nodded, then hit me with the gut punchiest of all gut punches. Pinky promise? Oh no. Pinky promises for us ain't no joke. They're like contracts. Break a pinky promise and people will make you feel like you in jail or something. Friendship jail, or in this case, big sister jail. Maddie held out her pinky. I hooked mine onto hers, touched thumbs. Now she knew there was no way I would let her down. Then she got back to business. She tapped the letter. So, you know where to send this? She followed, blow after blow after blow, killing me, waffle. But this one, I couldn't answer at all. I just couldn't. So I just left, ran to my room, threw myself on the bed, curled into a ball. Breathe, Patty, breathe. Crazy thing was, the next day at school, we were having a field day and I was paired on a relay race team with Lou. I knew, I said I never ran once, but this wasn't like a real relay. This was more just slapping each other's hands and running as fast as we could. And after our race, it was Lou who told me about his track club this about his track club he was in at the time, the Sparks. That night, I went home and asked Uncle Tony and Momley, and all the dots connected. My first club team. The rest, as they say, is history or present. All I know is it just seemed like something somewhere. Um, legs don't got souls, right? <laughs> was telling me to do it, pushing me to do it, not just for me, but for dad and for mom and for Maddie, who, bonus, I suddenly, thankfully, had an answer for. Pinky promising all. Turkey wings. Momly made turkey wings every single night, every single night. Oh, so it's always funny because when Uncle Tony says things like, dinner's almost ready, I never have to ask what we're having. I know what we're having, turkey wings with rice and a veggie, um, usually broccoli, not even turkey breasts or a turkey leg or even a turkey sandwich, wings only. I had never had them before we came to live with them. And the first night Mommy cooked them, I told her I liked them. And that was it. It was set in stone. Turkey wings for life. 
Momly kept the kitchen just like she kept the car, clean, germ-free, scrubbed from top to bottom with something sudsy and bright colored like sun yellow that smelled like rotten lemon or mutant green that smelled like every flower in the world sneezed. I pulled up to the table. Maddie was peeling fat off the meat. Cauliflower tonight, white broccoli, but not nearly as white as the spotless dinner plates. After I told Momly what I had to tell her every night, which was that I was sorry for not finishing my homework in time to help her, she kicked off the dinner small talk by telling us about her favorite patient, See, she's got her own business, but it don't make her vote money where she takes care of sick people. Emily's Expert Care, which I think is a terrible name, by the way. Ain't got no warmth to it, no hug in it. I think it should be called something like In Emily's Arms or Mobile Mom, something like that. Maddie thinks it should be Momly to the rescue. And well, even though I don't like that name either, it would at least be a true statement, at least for mom. Because when me and Maddie went to go live with Momly and Uncle Tony, it just made sense for Momly to add Ma to the client list, along with the most talked about of them all, Mr. Warren, who Momly calls the sweetest old man alive. But I don't really know if my mother is the sweetest old lady alive. And Ma really, and Ma wasn't really happy about none of it at first, just because she don't really like nobody taking care of her. But at least it's family and not some stranger, even though she can definitely uh, be a lot to deal with. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe a stranger would have been better. I bet during those first few visits, Ma almost drove Momly to Jesus too, <laughs> or off a cliff. Well, my friends, we will end there. We will end there. So uh, that's how she got into running with the track team. It wasn't because her uncle tricked her or because her mom or momly tricked her, or even necessarily because she thought her dad would want her to do it. It was because she wanted for Maddie not to be so scared and worried about her mom's legs or any of them losing their legs. And she made the dreaded pinky promise. For she's like, I promise my legs aren't going anywhere. And what better way to prove it than to be on a track team? Because without your legs, you can't run. So they got to stay, right? Well, my friends, thank you so much for being here for our fabulous Fry Yay installment of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. I hope you have a great, awesome, fun, relaxing weekend. And I will see you right back here on our Marvelous Monday on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. I hope that you enjoyed the books. I enjoyed reading them with you and learning some new things with you. That is the best thing. The best thing is learning new things with you. We just learned about the story of how Patina started running with the track team and about that mountains under the ocean water thing. I've got to go research that a little bit because that is amazing, right? Well, my friends, with all that being said, so happy that you were here and I hope that you have a great weekend again and I will see you right back here on our marvelous Monday broadcast of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Until then, my friends, I will say bye.